Our sermon text today comes from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all times, in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly as I must speak. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, you have the words of eternal life. By your Holy Spirit, let your words pierce our darkness, strengthen our faith, and illumine our witness for you. Amen. Amen. The whole armor of God. This text is a bit scary. It's filled with mysteries, unknowns, fear, darkness, evil, a fearful apprehension, a sense that something bad will happen and is happening even now. Ironically, this text also contains a remedy, a remedy for coping, for overcoming, a practice which allows us to spiritually rise above the suffering and evil that surrounds us. Suffering that is both hidden as well as the evil that can be so visible, it stops us in our tracks. The evil that is plotted and planned in secret places, as well as the evil of a death dealing virus. The evil of separation brought on by diseases such as racism and sexism and ableism. The evil that keeps us, me and you, warring against each other. Human beings have caused each other a great deal of pain and suffering. Sometimes we know we are the one causing the suffering, and sometimes we are oblivious as to why we do the things we do that cause others pain. The Apostle Paul says the exact thing in Romans 7. He says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate is what I do. Then he says, it's not I myself who do these things, but my sinful nature. 
And so what he's not saying in this text, which sometimes people think he is saying is the devil made me do it. Right? He, he's not saying that. What he's saying is that this is what happens when we become uh, spiritually unaware, out of touch with our own inner voice, disconnected, not centered, tossed by every wind. We don't even realize that we are a pawn in someone else's game, being used as an instrument of evil because we are unaware. We're too busy to realize or too sad to realize, too focused on materialism to realize, too self-absorbed. And we don't realize that our actions and our choices are causing harm or resulting in tensions, in conflicts, in misunderstandings, in arguments and fights, and ultimately murder. We seek revenge, unaware sometimes that that's exactly what we're doing. And so we, we keep fighting one another, spouse against spouse, siblings against siblings, friend against friend, neighbor against neighbor, employees against employer, political party against political party, conservative, against liberal, dark skin against light skin, north against south, nation against nation, human being against human being. Oh, but our struggle is not against flesh and blood, not against one another, yet we keep fighting. But have we ever considered that we want the same things, right? That human beings really desire the same things. And, and what do human beings want? Well, I would imagine a good life. They want shelter, food, clean water. I imagine they want love, decent health care a hopeful future, right, for our offspring. I imagine we want companionship, we want good friends and neighbors. We want a government that cares for the well-being of its people. We want freedom, freedom to live and move and have our being. We want to be respected, respect for our shared humanity and respect for those things that make us unique and wonderfully made in the image of God. I believe deep down inside, we want similar things, but they may manifest differently from culture to culture. When you think about holding an infant, right? It doesn't really matter where you're from. There is, a, there is an awe. When you look at that little tiny baby and you see those little hands and little feet, I imagine that all people in some way come together to celebrate the union of two people. We all share feelings of sadness and grief when someone we love is gone from us. We all have different feasts and celebrations in honor of milestones. And many come together and practice some sort of ritual for religious holidays. We all have traditions that gather us as a people. We all smile, we all laugh, we all cry. We all sneeze and cough and sleep and wake. Why? Because we share one humanity, yet we keep fighting each other. 
And I have to wonder what causes human beings to go at each other the way we do. Is it greed? Is it hate? Is it a sense of superiority? You see, we keep looking through one another and not at each other. We keep seeing others through our natural eyes and not our spiritual eyes. Instead, we look through a lens of, of hate and prejudice and discrimination, a lens of greed and comparison, right? Why, why do they have what I don't have? Why did their life turn out so good and mine didn't? We look through a lens of jealousy and pride, a lens of learned aggression and ignorance about others, a lens of inferiority and superiority. We are blinded by all those things and much more, and we are led by blind guides, right? Isn't what Jesus, Jesus said that to the Pharisees, right? You blind guides. He's talking about the leaders and the rulers and the authorities and the cosmic powers and the spiritual forces of evil. We are unaware of the fact that we are fighting a spiritual battle, that there are forces operating in the world that seek to steal to kill and destroy. You see, that's their primary agenda. And guess what? They are recruiting. They are looking for those, especially those that are spiritually unaware, unaware. Scholars widely agreed the church in Ephesus perceived the source of the threat to their community as entirely spiritual. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. However, it may have been more complicated than that. You see, in Ephesus, right, considered a new city center, it had been built up by the cult of the emperor, including the then ruling emperor. A temple to Augustus lay at the heart of the city center which was added to an older temple to Artemis, a virgin goddess of the hunt. Statues and temples to emperors Tiberius and Emperor Domitian were later included in the city center. So the imperial cult affirmed that emperors, once they died, ascended to join the other gods in heaven, right? So this is when Paul is talking about the evil forces in the heavenly places, right? He's talking about these, these dead emperors, right? So clearly these forces of evil were not merely spiritual. These rulers in the heavenly places had earthly counterparts. So that, that might even be worth writing down, right? These rulers in the heavenly places had earthly counterparts. Human beings, you and me, carrying out the evil plans of our ancestors, right? Not even fully understanding why. Why do we hate this particular group? Well, I don't know. But my parents and my uh, great grandparents, they all did. So that's why I do. It's sort of generational. We pick up these bad habits and these traditions. We're not questioning why. So the Ephesians are encouraged to then put on this armor, this full armor of God. And this armor is metaphorical. Because the real armor of the community is spelled out in verses 14 through 20. The armor of truth and righteousness, 
proclamation of the gospel of peace, the armor of faith, confidence of your salvation, the armor of the word of God, the Holy Spirit, and the armor of prayer. See, the appropriate way to fight against the demonic forces of evil is to proclaim the gospel of peace. The purpose of the armor is not to enable the Ephesians to be aggressive. It is to empower them to stand against the wiles of the devil. See, the use of armor imagery is not unexpected for this community. The Roman army was one of the major tools of Roman rule in conquered provinces of which Ephesus was one. Twice readers are instructed to put on the full armor, the breastplate, a belt, proper shoes for battle, a shield, a helmet, and a sword. Familiarity with how Roman soldiers were fitted out for battle is assumed. However, there is a striking difference between the armor of a Roman soldier and that of the church. So imagine a people living in fearful times, willing to take seriously the suggestion that they arm themselves with truth and righteousness and the gospel of peace and faith and confidence of salvation and the word of God and the Holy Spirit and prayer. Paul urges the Ephesians in an earlier chapter to put away our former way of life, put away how we would normally deal with conflict, put away those practices that no longer apply, that are no longer helpful, that are discriminatory and exclusive. Put away the former way of life. Because in order to really see the beauty of another human being, in order to see the similarities we share and the differences that allow us to survive in a world that requires all different kinds of gifts and talents, a world that demands variety in order for it to work well. We need to look up to our source. We need to look up higher, come up higher in our thinking in order to catch a glimpse of what God sees, what God wants to reveal to us in our spirit, because God is spirit and we are spiritual beings having a human experience. So how then do we overcome evil in what appears to be such a passive way? in such a non-violent Gandhi, Dr. King, Jesus sort of way. We do so spiritually because the goal of the armor is to defend, not to attack. Paul's focus is not on the precise functions of each piece of equipment, but on God's gifts, right? That's how we fight. We fight with God's gifts, the gift of truth, right? We seek the truth in all situations, the gift of righteousness, the gift, the gift of peace, right? We are peace seekers, the gift of faith, right? In, in believing what we really can't see right now, the gift of salvation, right? That we have this eternal life even beyond the earth, the gift of scripture, the word of God, our instruction manual, the gift of the Holy Spirit, right? Our internal compass, our guide, and the gift of prayer, 
which is really for our benefit. These are our weapons. Grounding ourselves with this armor provides protection and the ability to stand our ground. The ability to resist. Now, now trust me when I tell you this is not the easy way out. This is not weakness. This is not doing nothing. It takes greater inner fortitude not to strike back, not to lash out, not to lose your temper than it does to give in to your natural inclinations. There's a level of self-control that needs to happen. Self-control is another gift of the Holy Spirit. A spiritual battle requires spiritual weapons. The armor of God does not mean that the church will not encounter difficulties. But it does mean that Christians are now enabled to encounter such difficulties through perseverance, through prayer. The church may boldly proclaim the gospel of peace, even in the midst of persecution and hardship. Even in the midst of it. As we pray for the people of Afghanistan who are being persecuted, as we pray for them and against the evil forces that are operating there, we are indeed fighting for them. As we donate to organizations like No One Left Behind, which is an organization that charters flights for Afghans, right? Uh, send in the planes to get the people out at their own detriment or as we email our elected officials, urging them to expand Afghan refugee protections. Indeed, we are also fighting. As we seek God through his promises on behalf of the people of Haiti, right, who are going through hardship, we are fighting for them. See, Haiti has been devastated by a 7.2 magnitude earthquake, lashed by a tropical storm, dumping up to 10 inches of rain, struggling with the coronavirus pandemic, as well as still recovering from other disasters, including the recent assassination of their president praying for the people of Haiti is doing something. So we're going to we're going to pause and we're going to pray, right? We are going to access the spirit and engage in the warfare. Let us pray. God of compassion, whose desire for all peoples is wholeness, life abundant, and peace. Hear us as we pray in sorrow for the people of Haiti and the lives lost and communities shattered by the devastating earthquake and its aftermath. These island neighbors, still not wholly restored from the catastrophic earthquake of 2010, continue to struggle to move forward under increasingly heavy burdens of poverty and chronic hunger, civic unrest, hurricanes, and COVID-19. They need the oneness of our purpose and the tangible outpouring of our love, which is our prayer in action. As your servant Elijah fled for his life into the wilderness, and found bread for the journey, may survivors of this disaster find in the outpouring of their neighbor's care, shelter, sustenance, and companionship 
in the midst of horrors. In the sheer silence that follows, when the cries for help are stilled and the cameras and the news cycle have moved on to another tragedy, may it be your voice we hear calling us to bear witness, calling us to remember, calling us to bring ourselves to a ministry of prayerful presence and potent generosity. Let us have an answer when your voice inquires, what are you doing? Let us answer with our prayers. Let us answer with generous gifts. Let us join together an international community of healing to rebuild, to restore, and in time to rejoice that in a world that suffers, light still shines and darkness and dust shall not overcome it. In the name of our human savior, we pray, amen. Amen.